we were trying to work out what we could do at the Red Hat Summit to show off these amazing projects that our researchers are working on and the grad students that they look after and mentor. And we realized that we ought to be able to pull together an event at the summit that would bring together our customers and our Red Hat partners and the researchers that we work with and that hopefully that interaction would produce some new ideas for the researchers as well as a nice overview of what we're what we're looking for in the future for our partners. Um, so we, we got together with the researchers that we work with here at, in Boston, um, in particular Azar Bustavros and Aron Krieger at Boston University and asked them to pull together two tracks, a track on privacy preserving AI, so multi-party computing, differential privacy and the like, and a track on the end of the general purpose CPU, is how I sort of grandiosely titled it, um, which was all about hardware specific um, uh, projects to discover new ways we can make the OS um, take advantage of exotic hardware devices. They uh, were very enthusiastic about it and they pulled together, um, I guess we had 11 or 12 talks during the day with time for questions and a lot of Q&A and, and an, an ask from us for the audience to write down ideas and topics that they wanted our researchers to look at in the future. Um, and it came off great. It was a very, it was a real pleasure to get to do it. Um, the, I think the researchers learned a lot about what's going on at Red Hat and what our customers are interested in, and I know that our, I know that the partners who were there um, learned a lot about the, about all of the projects. Data science and machine learning are about making it easy to infer hidden information from large data sets. That's what extracting knowledge from data is. Interestingly, machine privacy tools is exactly the opposite. Privacy tools is about making it hard for adversaries to uncover confidential information from large data sets. So you should think about privacy and about machine learning as literally opposing one another. One is about, I want to find out about you from some signal I get. And the other one is, I want to hide what you do. They literally are trying to do um, opposites. Oddly enough, they can work together in a very interesting way to enable that, um, that workflow. Uh, the last bullet there is what I believe should be interesting to many of us, which is how do we make these tools integrated into practical, usable, accessible software stacks because some of the technologies, some of the techniques so are difficult. You cannot expect every programmer to understand that. So what are the best practices in integrating all these technologies in our software stacks? So tools of data analysis tend to revolve around the idea of maximizing some objective function, whether it's ad revenue or traffic flow, or just getting you from point A to point B, um, or the successful recognition of what you say to your cell phone. Um, and I think that it's fair to say that many of these efforts were kind of frustrated. Even, you know, I remember hearing in my own years in grad school, um, back in God knows uh, the 90s, about the idea of a neural network and how it might be computationally interesting to consider such a, such a construction. Um, but somehow the word on the street, at least in the math community, was that this wasn't really going anywhere. And you know, that, that we weren't really going to be able to do much with these things. They were more curiosity or a fantasy of some sort of metaphorical imagination that if we design a computer to work like the brain, maybe we'd get interesting results. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so fast forward, and um, you know, as of about five years ago, I think, or maybe it was happening in certain circles earlier, 
the, the consensus seems to be that there was some kind of inflection point in the efficacy of the, maybe it's the, the number of layers, maybe it's the computational power, maybe it's the size or the variety of the training data and how well these methods were working. Um, and yet, we're sort of not entirely sure how this happened or why. I mean, there are various theories that have been posited, but mathematics has suddenly become very preoccupied with the question of what is the right theory to model the success of deep learning methods. Um, and, and the success, I think, seconds the question of, you know, are we now in a, in a regime where we can, I mean, this is somewhat rhetorical question, especially coming from someone who holds the title Dean of Science, can, can, we, can we imagine that somehow all science is now conceivably data-driven? That if we just simply collect enough data that and throw it at any scientific question, that it can be answered with the application of, of algorithms. And, and this gets to an old debate, and, and something that I just feel like would be useful to tease out in this room with this community, uh, because I think that better industry-university collaboration will be part of how we move past this. This is sort of the idea of radical imperial, empiricism that you could solve all problems with enough data versus rationalism, which is you know, sort of more the idea that just by thinking hard enough about a problem that you will ultimately arrive at the solution regardless of how much information <laughs> you have to, to bring to bear on it. Oh, you know, this is, this, there's a beautiful metaphor which is kind of the, the ant which just uses the available tools to solve the problem in front of it versus the spider, which uses its own webs to spin more and more complicated, self-referential, this is you know, resonant to me, the pure mathematician. And maybe it's the bee in the middle that, that actually takes, synthesizes tools, and synthesizes the information it brings back to the, to the hive and produces something um, sweet. Why do we have all this hardware um, kind of innovation, proliferation of new ideas? The cloud is a lie. And the lie of the cloud was all CPU cycles are created equal. I want to do is focus this afternoon on just one area, which is, as Chris had said, we think there's this fundamental transformation. This is part, he totally stole what Uli was going to talk about. But what we think is that there's this fundamental change where now suddenly operating systems and hardware is again really relevant. And we've started kicking off a whole bunch of projects. These are, some of these projects are about a year in and a bunch of these projects are just starting off. Um, so you'll hear about some really early research projects. Yeah, so some of them are really tied to problems which we have been seeing, which are not just new inside Red Hat and some, they actually have been developed somewhere else, so we will see this. Some of them are really far out, so based on some, uh, some papers and so on, you will see hear this later on about this. We are also touching areas which Red Hat traditionally hasn't been looked at at all, so we haven't really been involved in the development of hardware or anything like that in the past, so this is now up to some extent changing, at least with the advent of reprogrammable hardware, we have an intersection there. And I think we have the possibility to at least imagine how a world could look like where we are uh, applying the free software model to the world of reprogrammable hardware, because this is actually not something which the industry, which it actually has been doing this for a long time, has ever taken seriously, in my opinion. So they, this is all about proprietary IP blocks, et cetera, and monolithic applications running there. So we're now working on, you will hear Ahmed later talk about an approach, how we can actually make this more look like software than in hardware in the traditional sense. We have an intersection there, and I think we have the possibility to at least imagine how a world could look like where we are uh, applying the free software model to the world of reprogrammable hardware. Uh, we have three examples here, which I'll go through very, very briefly. Uh, first is lossy compression. In many, in many, many HPC applications are large simulations that generate petabytes of data per 
per minute. Uh, there's no way that any rational I.O. system could handle this, or if it could, it would be, it would be ridiculously expensive. Lossy compression has become the way to do this. The problem, half a day per terabyte. Uh, so we've shown just recently that you can do this at streaming rate. In other words, well, where am I? Uh, you, we can do this at, uh, well, tenth of a terabyte with 10 FPGAs. In other words, we can sync the entire load of the number one cluster on the IO500 with 10 FPGAs. Um, we've done work with collectives, uh, and we've shown that you can do processing of MPI collectives, that's uh, broadcasts and reductions, in line in the router. Also the NIC, but that's less interesting, but in the router. Uh, and that's is instead of spending thousands of instructions. Uh, message matching, an obscure, perhaps, but critical function of um, most high-performance computing, uh, well, messages. Uh, and again, uh, offload here, tens of microseconds in software, hundreds of nanoseconds in hardware. So let me tell you a little bit about how uh, the system worked that we were running here. Uh, the idea was to uh, allow the user to write single-threaded code. It's going to run on a single core. And the question was, could we somehow uh, find ways that uh, behind the curtain we could parallelize it across multiple cores? And the idea was to have the operating system executing kind of like a debugger. It's going to periodically check in on the execution of the process, trying to learn something about how it's been evolving. And then to just make a bunch of guesses about where that process might be in the future. By where, I mean the exact memory state, the address space layout, and any of the register content. Uh, armed with those guesses, the OS is going to throw them onto a bunch of speculative cores. Are you listening? Um, uh, onto a bunch of speculative cores and try to execute these all in parallel, zipping the computation together at the end. So, so most of us are familiar with the realities of the slowdown Moore's law, where We've always had the benefit of like uh, 2x uh, increase in uh, transistor density, and and they've had ma massive gains, uh, uh, you know, in the past 20 years. And recently, it's kind of plateaued. And the thing that makes uh, Moore's law useful is actually uh, this other law called uh, Denner scaling, which means that as you're increasing the density uh, of your of your of your transistors, you actually uh, maintain the uh, maintain the uh, the power to actually to actually dissipate uh, 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 the the heating, right? And and that's how we've been we've been kind of getting the uh, uh, doubling of the performance per watt uh, every every two years. And this and this kind of uh, this kind of benefit we've gotten have actually slowed since 2006, and it's on trajectory, and if on this trajectory, it's uh, going to die out in a few years. And this has implications for, uh, in terms of how computation is done uh, in perhaps the next 10 years, and et cetera. And, and coinciding with the uh, end of dinner scaling is, this, is, is, the, is the reality of multi-score scaling, in a way, right? So maybe about 15 years ago, the big thing was letting programmers identify parallelism in their code. And that's when we came up with a lot of tooling to write parallel programming, because we couldn't keep increasing the single core performance. Right? So we had to spread the, uh, the transistors across multiple cores. And the programmer job was to kind of write parallel code. And there's a little bit, there's a, uh, unfortunately, there's a law there called Amdahl's law, which says that your parallel speed up is limited by the portion of your code that's, that's zero. Right? So, so in this graph, it says that just with 10% of your code, uh, zero, you get just a fraction of the speed up, no matter how many processors you're gonna put. So we might be seeing 64 or 94, maybe in like five, 10 years, it wouldn't make a difference in terms of performance because you're no longer gonna get that scalability we got. And this has implications when we think about the kind of applications that we're running these days, right? In the last, Maybe 20 years, a lot of things have been moving to the cloud. We were kind of using economies of scale to consolidate resources uh, in the cloud, where all of our high-performance applications are running in data centers. And a significant portion of it is, goes into uh, cooling. 
and, and how we, how we, how we, how we uh, cool the data center and making sure that we have better energy efficiency. And that's kind of the, the, the key in terms of uh, computing, in terms of how we use hardware and how systems interact with hardware, which is the energy efficiency at this point, right? Like two fundamental questions that should be asked is, can we reduce the power to get the same performance uh, for, the, for the set of applications running? Or can we increase some performance using the set amount of power? And to resolve this, there's been kind of two, two high-level techniques that's been done both in industry and in academia. Right? In industry, we're seeing more and more diverse, diverse and complex hardware, from traditional accelerators or GPUs to like tensor processing units. And as more hardware is added, they become they've they start to become more programmable in a sense, where they're putting controllers that you as a you as a application writer can put your own logic in them. And so things like a, a programmable SSD, programmable memory, there's various kinds of uh, social persistent memory being added, and there's kind of different kinds of interconnects. And, all, and also, like Ahmed said, there's all these things you can do with FPGAs, et cetera. You put a little sign on your table and tell everyone what you're talking about. It's actually, it's, it's a little bit We're really excited, and our challenge from my boss, our CTO, for next year is to make it twice as big. <laughs> 